hi guys i'm back again today with a new video and this is by omar suleiman uh, i think he's the one that we were reacting to uh daily he had his daily small talks oh doors to china i think uh but anyways today he's talking about the woman warrior and we're going to check it out so before we start don't forget to subscribe click the bell button and let's begin new time والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Tonight we are going to be speaking about inshallah ta'ala um, well, this a was woman live. who truly is in a league of her own and when I say she's in a league of her own you know many times you find a genre of sahaba of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and then you talk about you know three or four of them that four of them that match the category but with this woman, she actually is entirely in a league of her own in that there is literally no other companion that is like her, radiallahu ta'ala anha. And subhanAllah, it's interesting because we're coming off of, if you guys really want to make me feel good, who did we talk about last week? Hassan and Muthabits, okay. Not a hard question. I just wanted to make sure that you're still with me, inshallah, from the very start. We just finished talking about <coughs> Hassan ibn Muthabit, radiallahu anhu. And Hassan ibn Thabit is a man who is specifically known for not fighting. Oh. Right? And is still praised by the Prophet. Right? A man who refused to be in any battle and actually was unable to see the battlefield in any capacity whatsoever. Yet still, he is someone who is deeply praised by Allah and by the Messenger. And today, we're going to be talking about a woman in. Nusayba bint Ka'b radiallahu ta'ala anha who is only known for literally one thing which is fighting which is being in the battlefield so subhanallah you find this interesting contrast amongst the companions it's her name is literally there wasallam, and there is practically nothing narrated about this woman except for the battlefield that oh. we're going to be talking about today radiallahu ta'ala anha and fair warning it's a bloody story there's a lot of blood in this story there's a lot of sacrifice in this story and as I thought about, subhanAllah, what to title uh, Nusayba radiallahu ta'ala anha with, she's literally the mother of all sacrifice. You know, she reminds me, subhanAllah, of when you see some of those women from the areas of the ummah that are under oppression, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for them, and multiple of their children have been martyred, have, have, oh. have been shuhada, and they still respond with rida, with pleasure with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this exemplary patience that you don't see anywhere else, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for those widows of the ummah and those, those women who often face some of these devastating circumstances and their courage is on full display. This woman, radiallahu ta'ala anha, reminds me of those women, or rather those women remind me of this particular uh, woman, radiallahu ta'ala anha. So let's introduce her a bit with her story. Uh, her background, inshallah ta'ala, first. So her name is Umm Umara, Umm Umara, Nusayba bint Ka'ab ibn Amr al Ansariya. So she is Nusayba bint Ka'ab ibn Amr al Ansariya. And her name is also Nasiba. 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 Both pronunciations are correct. So her name is recorded as both Nusayba and Nasiba. So if anyone wants to name their daughter Nasiba instead of Nusayba, it's fine, inshallah ta'ala, as both of them are narrated as Ibn al-Athir, rahimahullah, uh, says. And they're both correct. So she is also someone from the tribe of Banu Najjar. Can anyone tell me who Banu Najjar is? At this point, hopefully some of you can remember as we get into the details of the story. They are the maternal relatives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Oh, Who can maternal. Tell me some of the companions that belong to Banu Najjar. Ben. I'll give you a clue. Najjar. The last one we covered. All right, Hassan ibn Thabit, the person who hosted the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Abu Ayyub al Ansari, uh, the mother of Anas ibn Malik. I'm just testing you guys, I'm trying to wake you up. Who, who's the mother of Anas ibn Malik? Um Sulaim radiallahu anha. So. There's, there are a few of the Ansar that belong to this tribe of Banu Najjar, and Banu Najjar was a sub-tribe of Khazraj, was a sub-tribe of Khazraj, and they were the Akhwal, they were the maternal relatives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and so they had 
a greater attachment or a greater affection to him by the standards that existed at the time, by the standards that existed at the time. Now, we don't have any information about her parents. The assumption is that her parents passed away before Islam even came to al Medina. But what we do know is that as far as she is concerned, both her and her husband's, her previous husband, as well as the husband that uh, she would marry afterwards, all accepted Islam, and her brothers also accepted Islam. So her brothers are Abdullah ibn Ka'b and Abdurrahman ibn Ka'b, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Uh, Abdullah ibn Ka'b and Abdurrahman ibn Ka'b were both uh, early companions of the Prophet وسلم, from Medina, meaning they were from the first of the Ansar to accept Islam. They took bay'ah with the Prophet وسلم, they attended every battle with the Prophet وسلم, and her brother Abdurrahman in particular is known as one of al-Bakka'een, one of those who were crying. I don't expect you all to remember too much about this, but you remember in the story of Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, there were a group of companions who could not go out in Tabuk because they didn't have the means. And so they cried, they wept, oh. because they wished to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So one of those people that was noted as being amongst those that were crying, those that sincerely wished they could be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala athbata lahum al ajr. Allah Azza wa Jal recorded their good deed in the Quran as if they were there in Tabuk with the Prophet ﷺ because they were sincere in wishing they could be with the Prophet ﷺ is her brother Abdurrahman who was grieving when he found himself unable to go out with the Prophet ﷺ in the battle of Tabuk. So her brothers have this quality as well of rushing to the side of the Prophet ﷺ and wanting to be there for the Prophet ﷺ. Now she has Two husbands that are recorded, uh, and it's important to note because it's, it's actually very interesting. Her first husband is Zayd ibn Asim. Zayd ibn Asim radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And it appears, and Allah knows best, that they were married before Islam and divorced before Islam. Okay? However, he's also a companion. All right? Her second husband is Ghaziya, Ghaziya ibn Amr. Ghaziya ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So, both her previous husband, as well as the husband after, uh, Zayd as well as Ghaziya, Zayd ibn Asim and Ghaziya ibn Amr, are both companions of the Prophet ﷺ. So when Islam eventually came to al Medina, they both are considered from the early, uh, early companions of the Prophet ﷺ from al Medina. From her first husband, Zayd ibn Asim, she has two, her two famous children, her two famous sons. The first one is Habib ibn Zayd. The second one is Abdullah ibn Zayd. So it is, again, you have Nusayba or Nasiba bin Ka'ab, her first husband Zayd ibn Asim, and she has her two famous sons from them, who we're, who we're going to learn about as well in the story, bidnillahi ta'ala, Habib ibn Zayd and Abdullah ibn Zayd. Uh, and then from her second uh, husband, Ghaziya, uh, she has a boy, that's named Tamim and a girl that is named Khawla uh, that we don't know much about. Radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in. That are recorded, their names are there, but we don't know much about them at all. Mm. Her two sons are very famous. We'll see why they're very famous, but her two sons, Habib ibn Zayd and Abdullah ibn Zayd, are very famous. SubhanAllah, all of them, her previous husband and her current husband at the time that Islam came, all of her children are amongst those who embraced Islam immediately when they heard about it in Medina. Mm. She was amongst those who heard the message from Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So if you put yourself in her shoes, she is one of those who attended the first gathering of Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu when he comes to Yathrib at the time in that gathering by As'ad ibn Zulara and he starts to talk to the people about Islam, about this new message from Mecca. However, you start to see some of her famous character from the very start, which is that she did not wait for the Prophet to come to Medina. She instead herself went to Bay'atul Aqaba al Thani, the second pledge with the Prophet. So the first pledge was in Mecca with the six men, privately with the Prophet. And then the second one is the 72 or 73 companions that came to Mecca the next year in Hajj after embracing Islam with Mus'ab ibn Umayr and they privately took the bay'ah with the Prophet They were 70 men 
70 men mm. and two women or three. So we, we know there are 70 men that came from Medina to Mecca in this daunting journey with Mus'ab radiallahu anhu and met the Prophet privately to take the bay'ah with him. And obviously it's understood that when they take the bay'ah, they take the bay'ah on behalf of their families as well. But Nusayba was one of those who was mm. insistent that she herself go mm. to the Prophet and she take the pledge with the Prophet And so she narrates about this time. And it's narrated first from one of the male uh, companions. Uh, in fact, from Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, اجتمعنا بالشعب ونحن سبعون رجلا ومعنا امرأتان That we met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa privately, uh, in secrecy, uh, in Mecca, and we were 70 men, and we had with us two women. And he says, Nusayba bint Ka'b, Umm Umara, and another woman, Asma bint Amr, who was known as Umm Manir, Umm Manir. So Nusayba bint Ka'b, Umm Umara, and Asma bint Amr, Umm Manir. And in some narrations, we also have the mother of Anas radiallahu anhu, Umm Sulaym radiallahu anha. So two or three women that actually went on that journey, which was a very daring journey, to take the pledge with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took the pledge with the 70 men, they lined up and they all shook the hand of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they took the pledge with him. And then she now narrates, she says that Zawji uh, Ghaziya, my husband Ghaziya, said to me, Ya Rasulullah, hatani imra'atan hadarata, that these are two women that have come to take the bay'ah with you as well. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, then let it be, and he took it verbally, and he said, la usafih an nisa, I do not shake hands with women. So this was mm. the famous narration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, la usafih an nisa, I do not shake hands with women, was in fact in bay'atul aqaba, a thaniya, was in the second bay'ah uh, with the 70 men and these two women that had come from al Madina to embrace Islam with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but he took the bay'ah with them still, with the same verbal allegiance alayhi salatu wasalam, that he took from the 70 men. This is the earliest recollection that we have of her. <clears throat> we don't have much about her before Islam. In fact, we have nothing about her before Islam. And we don't have much about her after this except for the battles that she's going to take part in. But I just want you to appreciate for a moment the mindset. Hmm. that she goes out there herself to take this bay'ah with the Prophet Sallallahu and she wants to experience this as well. She also mentions in one narration that she brought her young children. So she's already gearing her children for this idea of sacrifice on the part of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So her two children, Habib and Abdullah at the time, Habib ibn Zayd and Abdullah ibn Zayd, were still young from her previous marriage and she took them to take the bay'ah with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now when the Battle of Badr comes around, she was not present at the Battle of Badr because the Battle of Badr of course took part away from al Madina, mm. right? And <clears throat> nor were her children present because her children were too young. However, both her previous husband and her current husband were amongst the Badriyun as well as her brothers, mm. okay? So her family is already out there in the Battle of Badr and they're considered from the best of the companions. And as we said, the only reason why her own children are not there, Habib ibn because Zayd and Abdullah ibn Zayd, is because they were still considered too young to fight in the Battle of Badr. Then comes the Battle of Uhud. Now, the whole biography of Nusayba bin Ka'b is pretty much summarized usually in the Battle of Uhud. But we're going to go beyond that because it's very interesting. She participates in Uhud, as we're going to see. But then after Uhud, she also participates in the Battle of Khandaq. She also goes to Hudaybiyah. She also participates in Hunayn. And then she participates in the Battle of Yamama. And then she participates in the Battle of Yarmouk. So oh, wow. basically, Uhud opened oh, wow. the door for this woman to where she wasn't going to miss the battlefield after that moment with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So while we usually think of Umm Umara, Nusayba bin Ka'b radiallahu anha for this famous role that she plays in the battle of Uhud. This was just the beginning for her radiallahu ta'ala anha. And you get this, you get this, this look through her eyes of the beginning of the battle because she was so famously tied to Uhud. 
you can't read the books of Sirah without seeing someone walking up to her in Medina and asking her about the, the day of Uhud. What was the day of Uhud like? So she narrates some of what happened with her, herself, which is very precious. When she can give you a first-hand account of Uhud herself, and others narrate what happened with her as well. And she narrates what happened to some of the companions on the day of Uhud as well. So she lived long enough to narrate the story of Uhud through her own experience, through her own eyes. And subhanAllah, it's very interesting because when I was reading through some of the narrations from Umm Umar radiallahu ta'ala anha about the day of Uhud, she would say, I can see, inni ara, I can see this person coming forth. I can see, ka'anni ashhad, as if I'm looking at it right now. So it's like every single time she told you the story of Uhud when you sat with her, she was narrating it and she was recalling every incident and oh, she was like I can moved see. by those moments because it was clearly the most defining mm. moment in her life radiallahu ta'ala anha. A day when most people ran away from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she was going to be one of those women who ran towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the few that ran towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she describes the way the battle of Uhud starts to take place. She describes the moment that 300 of the hypocrites abandoned the Prophet ﷺ before the battle even started. Oh. So the Prophet ﷺ is left already with 700 out of 1,000 because 300 men turned away from the battlefield right before it even started on the day of Uhud that on the premise feet. that Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Sarur said he's not taking my advice. We should have fought inside Medina. Uhud is considered on the outskirts of Medina. So she witnesses the abandonment of the Prophet And then she says that these 3,000 men came forward from the mushrikeen, from the disbelievers, to fight against our Prophet And while she's telling the story, she's asked, she said, were the women of the mushrikeen fighting? Did any of the women of the mushrikeen participate in the battle of Uhud? Because it's very clear that you participate in the battle of Uhud. So from the disbelieving side, did any of the women participate as well? And she said, none of the women from the mushrikeen, from the disbelievers, ever raised a hand on the day of Uhud, except to beat the drums and to sing the songs of celebration. Meaning what? There was a large group of women that came from the other side on the day of Uhud. Remember, Uhud was a day of vengeance for the disbelievers because of the loss of the day of Badr. And they wanted to make a scene. So they brought their women out, many of the widows of the leaders of Quraysh that died on the day of, of, of Badr. Of course, the most famous uh, one who's not a widow, but, but Hind bint Utbah, right? Hind bint Utbah coming with her husband Abu Sufyan. So many of the women came out to beat the drums and to sing and to participate on that day by chanting out these inflammatory lyrics and beating the drums on the day of Uhud. But that was also a show of force, that we have extras. We have extras. So she says none of them at any point lifted a hand except to beat the drums. Not even in the beginning of Uhud, because remember there's a point in Uhud where the Muslims defeated them decisively, right? She said that the women on their side fled just like the men had fled at that time. And then of course, as we know, they went around the back of Uhud and then they attacked the Muslims once again. So she says none of the women uh, lifted uh, a hand on that day from the mushrikat, from the disbelievers, except to beat the drums and to sing the songs of jahiliyyah, of the days of ignorance. She says, as for myself, she was with a group of some of the sahabiyat, some of the sahabiyat. female companions of the Prophet Wasallam, and they held with them the medical supplies that would mm. be necessary to rush into the battlefield and to help the wounded in real time. Now you know what's so beautiful about this narration because it can easily be missed? She says that with us was Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha, Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib radiallahu ta'ala anha, Umm Sulaym radiallahu anha, so basically the family of the Prophet oh. Like the Prophet did not try to protect his relatives first. Aisha and Umm Salama, the mothers of the believers were out there. Fatima radiallahu anha, bint al-Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa was out there. And she said, I was out there. The aunt of the Prophet was out there. Umm Sulaym was out there. And we were holding our buckets and we had our supplies and we were going to participate in this battle by running into the battlefield and treating the wounded as it was going to happen. So they weren't mm. there with drums, 
That already shows you the mindset. They weren't there with the drums and to sing or to carry wine. They were there to participate in this regard. Yeah. And she says that my husband and my two sons were next to the Prophet So at this point now, her two sons are old enough to participate. This is their first battle alongside the Prophet So Ghaziya anhu, and her two sons, Abdullah and Habib, the two sons were there with the Prophet ready to fight alongside the Prophet the true Ansari spirit. So her whole family is on the battlefield as this battle begins to unfold. And then, subhanAllah, as we all know, this was the day in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed about a group of companions, مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٌ صَدَقُوا مَا عَاهَدُوا اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِ فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَظِرْ وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبَدِيلًا When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, from the believers are, and I'm going to intentionally say, رِجَال مَنْ who were oh, truthful okay. to the covenant that they took with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَظِرْ وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا Some of them were able to fulfill their covenant right away, and some of them were delayed in fulfilling their covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they never lost any resolve. They remained committed to that mission. One of the proofs that some of the Mufassirun use that when the word rijal, when the word men is used in the capacity of men. righteousness and virtue, it is not referring to men as in males, but is referring to men and women. Rijalun la tulhiyum tizaratun wala bay'un an dhikrillah. There are other verses of this genre, is that they say uh, Umm Umara is one of these people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing. Umm Umara is one of these people that Allah is describing that were truthful with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not men as in males, it is the believers. The believing men and the believing women. It covers both the men and the women who were truthful in their covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because as we know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells the archers who were the strategic advantage of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do not come down from the hill until I instruct you to do so. If you see victory, wait until I tell you to come down. If you see defeat, even if you see them cutting our bodies into pieces, don't come down until you're instructed by the Rasulullah to come down from the hill. Well, Uhud unfolds, the Muslims attain victory, and the disbelievers run away, or so the Muslims think. And 40 of the 50 archers see the spoils. Remember, these people brought all sorts of victory memorabilia and all sorts of weapons to celebrate the day of Uhud and everything like that. Mm. They see all of that and 40 of the 50 come down despite the Prophet's lights on telling them not Some to come not down. To come, yeah. <clears throat> when they do that, they leave the back of the Muslims vulnerable. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu who at that time of course is on the other side recognizes the unique opportunity takes the disbelieving army around Uhud and attacks from behind. Now at that moment, it's mm. pandemonium, it's chaos. Most people instinctively flee the battlefield, oh. especially when in the midst of the chaos, they hear that we killed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qatalna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some of them cried and put their weapons down, some of them ran away, and there's just this small group of people. I mean, I want you to think about it. This is already the best generation of people, the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ. But there's this tiny group of people that then band around the Prophet ﷺ, recognizing that Rasulullah is still alive and seeking to protect the Messenger ﷺ. She said that when I saw, and it's very hard for you to uh, to really appreciate this unless you put yourself in the moment. So I want you for a moment to imagine yourself in the battle. I'm gonna and try. you see the best of the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ fleeing from the battlefield. This is not me sleeping. And you I'm see imagining. the swords of the opposing army landing upon the necks of people and killing people and butchering them and the blood is flowing. And in the midst of that screaming, 
What's going to cause you to jump in the middle of that? I'm Seriously, watching. Just think about it for a moment. I'm not because look. I'm not jumping in. I'm just watching. Like you have to think about the judgment call that she's about to make. What's going to cause you to look at all of that and say, "I'm going in," instead of running away? Now, for her, Nusayba رضي الله تعالى عنها. You could say, perhaps it's her husband and her two sons that are still mm. in the midst of that. Maybe that's why she's going to jump in. You remember the narration where the Prophet ﷺ and the companions are marveling at this woman running through the battlefield to pick up her crying child, completely ignoring the swords and the weaponry, and then holding her child and nursing her child. And the, the, the way that the companions looked at that and the Prophet ﷺ capitalizing on that to say, you think that woman would throw her child into a fire? And Allah is more oh. arham, Allah is more merciful to you than that mother is to her child. Meaning the mother loved her child so much that so she, risked her she life. jumped yeah. into the battlefield, not caring about anything that was around to pick up her child and to hold her child. Now I want you to think about <clears throat> a real life manifestation of the Prophet I'm saying, no one of you truly believes until you love the Messenger وسلم, more than you love your own parents, hmm. your own children, and your own self. Think about that. Meaning, while the hadith is used to convey the depth of Allah's mercy in using the love of a mother for a child that the mother would jump into this dangerous situation without even thinking twice about it to save her child, to hold her child. There are people that love the Prophet more than that woman loves her child. You understand what I'm getting at? Yes. There are people that love the Prophet more than that mother loves her child. And so instinctively, when she sees the people fleeing from the battlefield, she doesn't think about her own husband and her two sons. She said she immediately thought about the Prophet ﷺ. That in and of itself, subhanAllah, is stunning. And I'm going to jump into all of this because Rasulullah is in there. And I don't even know for sure that he's still alive and I'm almost certainly going to die. But whatever but. it takes. So she drops the bucket. She drops the materials that she had to treat the wounded on the day of Uhud. And she describes the moment that some people are, are fleeing and they're throwing their swords in the air and they're throwing their armor, they're throwing their shields. Why? Because they want to be khifaf, they want to be light. So you're trying to run away from the battlefield as quick as possible, so you're just, you're relinquishing what's in your hands. You're relinquishing what's on your body. And she said, I yelled out to one of the men that was running, Give your, give your weapons to someone who's going to fight on behalf of the Prophet oh, So wow. he threw it and she picks up a shield and a sword and she dives right in. SubhanAllah. Put yourself there. Mindset. I, every time I read the story, I try to, I'm like, let me think about it. And I've been to Uhud many times. And in Uhud, if you close your eyes enough, you can actually, you can hear it. You can feel it. I mean, the shuhada are right there in front of you. She jumps in and she has her shield and she has her sword and she starts to swing that sword right and left. She doesn't and even know to fight, huh? Runs towards the Prophet. <clears throat> when she gets to the Prophet, she's described, she says that no one was around the Prophet at that point except for 10 or so people. And it it was me, my husband, and my two sons. So subhanAllah, oh, a whole wow. family that's nourished by this love of the Prophet ﷺ. She sees her husband and her two kids are amongst those people fighting alongside the Prophet ﷺ, trying to, trying to get the, the enemies away from the Messenger ﷺ and fight them off with whatever they have. Even if they lost their weapons, they're throwing stones at the mushrikeen. They're doing whatever they can to defend the Prophet ﷺ. So she gets there and she describes it that way. And then she says, that she describes this moment where she's next to Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And if you remember with Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Mus'ab tried to attract the enemy away from the Prophet sallallahu and he knew he looked like the Prophet sallallahu so he made a lot of noise with his horse and he did things to attract the attention 
of the mushrikeen so that they would run towards him and not towards the Prophet And so she describes seeing Mus'ab She's the one who sees him whipping up the dirt, trying to attract the mushrikeen towards him instead of towards the Prophet And she's not just waving her sword right and left. The Prophet used to boast about Nusayba radiallahu ta'ala anha and used to say that she was better than Fulan wa Fulan. He would name sallallahu alayhi wasallam the people, the warriors, the known warriors amongst the companions. Aww. He said, I look to my right and to my left on the day of Uhud and in front of me and behind me. And every direction I looked, I saw Nusayba bint Ka'ab Umm Umara radiallahu anha swinging her sword. That's Rasulullah's vantage point on that day. I looked at her and I saw her swinging her sword right and left and holding her shield and jumping in the midst of it. And she was better than so and so and so and so and so and so. I mean, she really got in. She didn't get in timidly. She really got into the midst of the battle. And she describes uh, that moment. And Abdullah, her son, he was close to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Ibn Umm Amara, the son of Umm Amara and he said yes because remember they were covered, it's me. Oh. So he said Armi, throw. And Abdullah said there was a man coming right at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on his horse and I took a stone and I threw the stone uh, first at the horse and it hit the eye of the horse that was riding towards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the horse fell on the ground and the man fell off and then I attacked the man. And once I attacked the man, I didn't have any weapons. I was just throwing stones and I was throwing whatever I could get my hands on. This is her son. I was wounded. I was struck by, this, by, by a, heavy, uh, a heavy hit. So mm. this man strikes me and I fall to the ground and I start bleeding and my mother comes to me Umm Umara, Nusayba radiallahu anha runs to him and she starts wrapping him up and she's saying, Qum, stand up and fight on behalf of the Prophet So the only moment that she puts down her own sword and her own shield is to get her own son, you know, bandaged up and saying, get up and fight on behalf of the Prophet So she wraps him up quickly and she stands him up and she says, go fight. She picks up her sword again and she picks up her shield again and she starts swinging. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Man yutiqi ma tutiqina, ya Umm Ammar. Who is it that could do what you do, O Umm Ammar? You know, it's amazing because in Uhud, the Prophet ﷺ was praising those companions in the midst of the chaos. Who could do what you're doing? Like, who is it that does what you're doing, O Umm Ammar? So she says, and so I continue to fight. And the Prophet ﷺ, as we're fighting, he points out a man and he says, Hada daribu ibniki. That's the one that hit your son. So Umm Umara, mashallah, mother. She gets she goes angry. After the man. She hunts down the man that struck her son and she, 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 she hits him with the sword and he falls off and then the companions were able to apprehend him and kill him. Oh. So she actually goes after the one who struck Abdullah on that day. And she was the reason why they were able to apprehend him and to kill him. And the Prophet وسلم, he smiled and he said, Alhamdulillah ladhi dhafaraki wa aqarra aynaki min aduwuki wa araki tha'raki bi'aynaki. Alhamdulillah, all praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave you that blessing, who let you see that revenge with your own eyes, who allowed you to take revenge on the one who hurt your son, the one who wounded your son. So, this is her mindset. I mean, she's a warrior, a serious warrior. She runs towards the man that struck Abdullah and she strikes him and she kills him. And then there's another man that comes charging at her with the horse. She averts the horse, she hits the horse, the man falls and she kills the man. Ooh. So she's in the midst of it all. And then she describes being next to Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu that at one point she looks up and she sees Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And she sees the man coming at Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu by the name of Abdullah ibn Qami'ah. And Ibn Qami'ah strikes Mus'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu and kills him. 
And subhanAllah, I mean, think about it. She was there when Mus'ab radiallahu anhu first brought Islam to Medina. She sat in that first gathering where Mus'ab taught them about Islam and she just saw with her own two eyes Mus'ab radiallahu anhu fall. And Ibn Qami'a was looking for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so once he kills Mus'ab radiallahu anhu and realizes that it wasn't the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he starts charging towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she says, I stood right in his way. Oh, wow. I mean, think about it. Like this so brave, furious horseman who's screaming, Ma najawtu in naja, I will not live if he lives, meaning I will kill him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm not going to let him go. This furious horseman is coming towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she gets in his way and she takes a stab at trying to hit him and she misses and she says that he was double armored, that he was oh. in two coats of armor, so I wasn't Heavy. able to affect him. And he strikes her right on the shoulder. And she said, I was wounded 13 times on that day. She had 13 wounds on the day of Uhud. So it's not like Ooh. she came out unharmed, 13 wounds. And they said that the gash on her shoulder from Ibn Qami'ah was so large and so, so devastating that it took her a year to get over it. It would take her a whole year Can after Uhud to be able to nurse that one wound from that day of Abdullah ibn Qami'a when he struck her. And then of course this was the man that then jumped on the Prophet ﷺ when he started to beat the helmet of the Prophet oh. ﷺ into his face. He knocked out the teeth of the Prophet ﷺ. He was trying to kill the Prophet ﷺ. So she witnessed that. She was in the midst of that. <clears throat> and then the Prophet ﷺ saw her wounded on the battlefield, and he says, Ya ibn Umm Umara, Ummak, Ummak, O oh, son of Umm Umara, your, your mom, your mom, your mom, your mom. So now Abdullah, who she had nursed prior to that, runs towards his mom, and he starts to nurse his mom. And then she gets up and she starts fighting on behalf of the Prophet Now SubhanAllah, for a moment, when the Prophet ﷺ looks around, and Rasulullah ﷺ never forgot those few people that never left him, that never left him on the day of Uhud, that surrounded him and never left him. For a moment, Rasulullah ﷺ looked around and he saw this handful of companions, and this handful of companions, there's only one entire family, and that's her and her family. Her, her husband, and her two sons, wounded, all swinging their swords, despite themselves almost dying, on the part of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam seeing that and saying, I looked right and left and everywhere I looked I saw Umm Umara radiallahu ta'ala anha swinging her sword. Again, what compels you to jump in the middle of that? What compels you to keep going even after you've been wounded, even after you've seen some of the strongest horsemen flee the battlefield or be killed mm. and you're still yeah, there wonder. with your own kids fighting on the part of the Prophet <clears throat> and in the middle of that as, the, as she's wounded and her kids are there Rasulullah starts to say what a family this is what a family the family of Umm Umara just what an incredible family Ni'm al bayt what a household you are. And she hears that. You know what she says to the Prophet She says, Ya Rasulullah, Udu'a Allah an rafiquka fil jannah. O Messenger of Allah, can you make dua to Allah that we will be with you in jannah? Like in the middle of that, you want to be with the Prophet She's not thinking, what's my ticket out of here? And like, yes, we are. Ni'm al-a'ila, ni'm al-bayt. What a great family we are. Ya Rasulullah, Ask Allah that we get to be with you in paradise the way we're with you in this battlefield of Uhud. <clears throat> and the Prophet ﷺ says, Allahumma ja'alhum rafaqa'i fil jannah. Oh Allah, make them my companions in jannah. And she says in response, Ya Rasulullah, ma ubali ma asabani min dunya I don't care what happens to me in this dunya after this. SubhanAllah. I don't care what happens to me. If I'm killed now, afterwards, the Prophet ﷺ just said, Allahumma ja'alhum rafaqa'i fil jannah. Oh Allah, make them my companions in paradise. <clears throat> so I don't care. Ma ubadi ma asabani min dunya. What 
whatever happens from here on out in this journey, I don't care. That is the purest expression of iman, of yaqeen, of faith and certainty that you can hear from a person's mouth. At this point, that's it. We heard it all. Rasulullah said that we're going to be his companions in Jannah. And so they fought on the part of the Prophet ﷺ and eventually were able to survive. And the Prophet ﷺ would walk by her after Uhud and Rasulullah would praise her and say, what a woman Umm Umara is, right? I mean, I remember the day of Uhud, right and left, in front of me and behind me. Umm Umara was there, radiallahu ta'ala anha fighting on my side throughout the entire battle of Uhud. There is literally no other person who has a story like this woman. No other person who has a story like this woman. And she continues <clears throat> after the battle of Uhud to be on the side of the Prophet Sallallahu And from that day onwards, how do you even tell a woman like that you're not going to be in the battlefield? <laughs> <laughs> so no one was ever going to tell her after that you can't participate, you're not going to be in the battlefield. So when a battle now takes place after Uhud, she grabs her sword just like everybody else and she goes in. So because it's now her sword. She's what not turning back. Or does she have her own Because now? this becomes her reputation, radiallahu ta'ala anha, that she is going to be in the battlefield with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so she was present like she was in Aqaba on the day of Hudaybiyah. She was present in Khaybar. On, on the day of Al Ahzab with the Prophet. ﷺ. She was present in Hunayn with the Prophet. ﷺ. And there are only a few ahadith that we have from her where she actually narrates a conversation. SubhanAllah, one of those is in a Tirmidhi. She came to the Prophet. Ataytu Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She came to the Prophet ﷺ and she said, Ya Rasulullah, ما أرى كل شيء إلا للرجال وما أرى وما أرى النساء يذكرن بشيء. Oh, Rasulullah, how come all I hear in the Quran is the men are being specified with all of these rewards and the women are not being mentioned in any way? So why is it that the, the men are being mentioned and not the women? Now, Subhanallah, of course, when Allah says رجال المؤمنين, it refers to and even as a function of the Arabic language, the men and the women. But she's someone that has literally been in the trench with the Prophet ﷺ, in Uhud with the Prophet ﷺ, on his side, and she's asking, Ya Rasulullah, will Allah specify the women in some regard? And Allah in this day and age, if a woman will say, oh, why is it that? If she asks this question, they will be like, oh, she's a feminist. Because for some reason, the feminists are ruining the terminology or even anything that is related to questioning women or like like whatever um nasiba uh, question was people will look at it and be like why are you being so feminist right in now in our day and age, I'm just saying. Ta'ala revealed what he revealed in al Muslimina wal Muslimati wal Mu'minina wal Mu'minati wal Qanitina wal Qanitati until the end of the ayah, the 35th verse of Surah Al Ahzab. Uh, and of course, there's a similar narration of Um Salama radiallahu anha asking the, asking the Prophet وسلم, the same thing that indeed the Muslim men and the Muslim women, the believing men and the believing women, the obedient men and the obedient women. As-sadiqeen wa sadiqat the truthful men and the truthful women. As-sabireen wa sabirat the patient men and the patient women. Until the end of the ayah where Allah specifically mentions the women, the women alongside the men in this regard. Speaker and talked in this about narration this too. This it verse. was Umm Umara who comes to the Prophet and says, Ya Rasulullah, are we going to get a specific mention as well? The way that the men are specifically mentioned. Radiallahu ta'ala anha. Other than that, it's just a handful of ahadith from the Prophet yeah, and a handful of incidents. One narration about al-wudu, one narration where she describes that the Prophet wanted to perform wudu and a vessel was brought to the Prophet وسلم, and it had thulthay al-mud, uh, just, just two-thirds of a mud of water was brought to him 
She mentions one narration from the Hajj of the Prophet وسلم, that the Prophet وسلم, said, Yarham Allahul uh, three times, may Allah have mercy on those that shave their heads three times. And then after that, they said, What about those who cut their hair? Uh, and the Prophet وسلم, said, On the third time, Wal Muqassireen, and those who cut their hair. And she has one famous narration from the Angel series that some of you might remember. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, visited her one day and she presented the Prophet وسلم, with some food. And the Prophet وسلم, asked her to sit down and to eat as well. And she said, I replied and I said to the Prophet وسلم, that I'm fasting. And the Prophet وسلم, responded, Ma min sa'imin yu'kalu indahu illa sallat alayhi al hatta yashba'u wa fi riwaya hatta yafrugu. That there is no person who is fasting while other people are eating in their presence, except that the angels will send their prayers upon them until they are full or until they leave. So this is her narration, radiallahu ta'ala anha. This took place in her home with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. However, subhanAllah, her story does not end there and it, it becomes once again a story of sacrifice. They are legends from the Battle of Uhud, right? Legends from the Battle of Uhud. But then arises towards the end of the, the life of, of the Prophet a but man by the name of Musaylama al kadhab the most famous uh, false prophet that rose in the time of the Prophet وسلم, Musaylama, the liar. And you'll hear about Musaylama today and I'll mention him as well next week inshallah because he's very relevant to the story next week as well in the ta'ala. Musaylama al kadhab as we've mentioned a few times already, was the most vicious of the false prophets and the one who ended up commanding a large following and he appeared right before the Prophet ﷺ passed away and then he tried to use the death of the Prophet ﷺ as a moment for him to take over and to command a larger following. And what he did was, is he first tried to make a compromise with the Prophet ﷺ that look, you be Rasulullah and I'll be Rasulullah too. You be Rasulullah for Quraysh, I'll be Rasulullah for Banu Hanifa and then we'll split up the land into two and will basically be co-messengers of Allah. So he tried to play that game. He started to make up his own Qur'an, and he was a vicious man. And he sends a letter to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, min Musaylima, Rasulullah, Rasulillah, ila Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rasulillah. From Musaylima, the messenger of Allah, to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the messenger of Allah, we have half the, the, the earth, you have half the earth, you take half the land, Quraysh will take half the land as Banu Hanifa, we'll split it up and we can share our mission together. Nu'aym ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says that when the Prophet وسلم, heard these ambassadors of Musaylima read this to them, the Prophet وسلم, says, ma taqulani antuma, what do you two say? I'm very curious, you two as you're reading this letter from this kathab, from this liar, what do you say? And they said, Kama qal. We say what he said. Meaning we're upon what Musaylima, the one who sent us, is upon. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ama wallahi, lawla anna rusula la tuqtal la darabtu a'na khakuma. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I swear by Allah, if it wasn't that ambassadors should not be harmed, I would have struck both of you right now. I mean, Wow. This is so disgraceful, right? And the confidence and the arrogance to come say that to the Prophet ﷺ in front of the companions. But look, and by the way, this is an authentic hadith in Abi Dawood. The Prophet ﷺ is honoring what? He's honoring the best ethics of war, that you know what? This man is basically waging war, but I'm not going to harm the ambassadors. I'm not going to harm you, because that would not be appropriate for the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, because there is a level of deception and a level mm. of transgression that is involved in that. So the Prophet ﷺ sends them away. Then Rasulullah ﷺ chooses to address Musaylima with his own letter and his own ambassadors. This is where we're going to see Nusayba's story become relevant once again. Ooh. So the Prophet ﷺ writes a letter, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, min Muhammad Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ila Musaylima al kadha From Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, to Musaylima, the liar. As-salamu ala man al-huda. Peace be on to those who follow rightful guidance. 
الْأَرْضُ لِلَّهِ يُورِثُهَا مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَالْعَاقِبَةُ الْمُتَّقِينَ As for the earth that you talk about dividing, the earth belongs to Allah. يُورِثُهَا مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah will give it to whom He wills. وَالْعَاقِبَةُ الْمُتَّقِينَ And victory belongs to the pious. Victory belongs to the pious. So Rasulullah he sends this letter and he appoints Habib ibn Zayd. Habib being the son of Nusayb ibn Ka'b. He appoints Habib ibn Zayd to be the ambassador along with one other companion. And he sends them to Musayb ibn Al-Kadhab. And when they arrive to Musayb ibn and they, they read this, this letter, Musayb says to them, or he says to first Habib ibn Zayd who reads, قَالَ أَتَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ do you bear witness that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Qala na'am. He said yes. Qala atashhadu anni Rasulullah. And do you bear witness that I am the Messenger of Allah? Habib ibn Zayd says, La asma'. I can't hear you. He says it again with an angrier voice. Atashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Do you bear witness that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah? He says yes. أَتَشْهَدُ أَنِّي رَسُولُ الله. Do you bear witness that I am the Messenger of Allah? Habib ibn Zayd says, لا أسمع, I can't hear you. He says it a third time, and he stands up and he comes close to him in a threatening posture. أَتَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ رَسُولُ الله. قال, نعم. Do you bear witness that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah? Yes. Do you bear witness that I am the Messenger of Allah? He says, I can't hear. So what he proceeds to do next what does he do? Yeah, I'm is curious, he like what he's going to essentially do. crucifies him while he's alive. Oh. He ties him up. And this is where you start to see the difference between a tyrant and a messenger of Allah. Mm. He starts to dismember him piece by piece while he's alive. Cuts his arms, oh cuts my. his legs, oh my. starts to mutilate him. And the entire time, Habib ibn Zayd is saying, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so he basically dismembers him in front of the people. And this is of course what tyrants resort to, to send a message to their followers, don't you dare flee us. Mm. He basically dismembers him he while he's saying, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And that is another act of transgression here. Remember the Prophet said, I'm not going to touch these ambassadors. That's not mm. how we work in terms of our ethics. Look what he did. Then he says to the other companion that was sent to the Prophet ﷺ, after he just watched Habib ibn Zayd dismember to death. Do you bear witness that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Qala na'am. He said yes. Of course not. Qala atashhadu anni Rasulullah. Do you bear witness that I am the Messenger of Allah? He said na'am, yes. What? And he said then get out of here. What does he, what did the, that, the other what man does comes mean? back to tell the Prophet ﷺ what happened. He comes back to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, Ya Rasulullah, halakt. Ya Rasulullah, I'm destroyed. He said, what happened? Ma sha'nuk. What happened? So he told him the entire story of what happened. The Prophet ﷺ was deeply moved. I mean, this is a disgusting act of transgression and against a young man, subhanAllah, and someone who's near and dear, someone who was there on the part of the Prophet mm -hmm. ﷺ on the day of Uhud with his family, and this is how he treated him. This is how he mutilated him in martyring him. And the Prophet ﷺ responds to this other companion who thinks that he's done, who thinks that his, his life is over because he thinks he basically apostated. قَالَ أَمَّا صَاحِبُكَ فَمَضَى عَلَىٰ إِمَانِهِ He said, look, as for your companion, Habib ibn Zayd, he died on his iman, he died on his faith. أَمَّا أَنْتْ فَأَخَذْتَ بِالرُّخْصَ As for you, you took the excuse. Like you shouldn't be so mad at yourself. And it's the same thing the Prophet ﷺ told Ammar ibn Yasir oh, yeah. when he written. watched Sumayyah, his mother عنها, killed, and he watched his father Yasir killed عنه, and Ammar عنه, at that moment he buckled and he said what Abu Jahl wanted him to say and he thought he was done. But it's so the Prophet ﷺ to... says, اليوم, what are you upon today? I bear witness that you're the messenger of Allah and that he is a liar, the Prophet ﷺ said, then you're okay. 
It's okay. Don't worry about yourself. Now he has to find a way to break the news to Umm Umar. Oh my gosh, yeah. Nusayba bin Ka'b radiallahu anha, not just about the death of her son, but about the way that he was killed. Mm. And when the news reaches this woman, Nusayba bin Ka'b radiallahu ta'ala anha, Umm Umar, listen to her words. She says, Min ajli hadha al mawqif a'adatuhu wa inda Allah tasabtuhu. That I prepared him for this moment and I've sought my reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with him. لَقَدْ بَايَعَ الرَّسُولَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ لَيْلَةَ الْعَقَبَةِ صَغِيرًا He took the pledge with the Prophet ﷺ on the night of Aqaba as a young man. وَوَفَّى لَهُ الْيَوْمَ كَبِيرًا And as an adult, he showed his loyalty. He showed that he was committed to that pledge with the Prophet ﷺ. But she's a hurt mom. She says, وَلَئِنْ أَمْكَنَنِ اللَّهُ مِنْ مُسَيْلَمَ لَأَجْعَلَنَّ بَنَاتِهِ يَلْطِمْنَ الْخُدُودَ عَلَيْهِ If I live long enough, and if Allah gives me the opportunity to see Musaylama, then I will cause his daughters to grieve him. Meaning I will take his life the way he took the life of my son. So she now is committed to what? <laughs> this man martyred my son in this way, and this man is a false prophet of Allah. And she has made the commitment that she wants to continue this fight, and she's going to go forward. SubhanAllah, as time goes on, she hears the call, Hayya ala qital al kathab. She <laughs> describes that moment when she's, heard, when she's told when the Muslims are called in Medina to go out and to fight al kathab, oh. to fight the liar. Musaylama at that point was dismembering and murdering and becoming far more emboldened. And his fitna was growing. It was one of the largest fitnas. It was looked at as an existential threat, as you'll see next week when we talk about Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu. It's like an existential threat to Islam. That's what it's perceived as. But of course, Allah Azza wa will preserve his deen, but that's how severe it is. But Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu calls for the battle towards al Yamama, the battle of al Yamama, the battle against the apostates. And she goes out. And she was over 60 years old with her son, Abdullah. Oh, wow. So Habib has been martyred. And she's now with her second son, Abdullah. And she takes an oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that she's going to be present at that moment when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives her that revenge. This is a, a unique, strong woman. 60. And on the day over of your mama, 60. just imagine in the midst of everything that's going on, you're facing this cruel man and this fortress, which was called the fortress of death, because of what he used to do to people. Mm. And she's saying, Aina adu Allah duluni alayhi. Where is the enemy of Allah? Show me where he is. Where is the enemy of Allah? Show me where he is. This is the courage of this woman. And she's there with her son, and they are advancing forward the entire time, and no one is going to tell her to stay home. No one's going to tell her to not be present in the battlefield. Mm hmm. Now we may know, subhanAllah, that no. the man that throws the spear that strikes Musaylama is who? Wahshi. Wahshi, who on the day of Uhud threw the spear that killed Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Wahshi said from his tawbah, from his repentance, he used the same spear against Musaylam al kadhab So he spotted him on that day and he threw the spear and he said, Qataltu khayran nas, I killed the best of people and I killed the worst of people. Oh. Now, when Musaylama was struck so by that he's spear, like, he was fighting against before, and then in this war, he's fighting with. Them. So, okay, okay. The blow from the spear is what killed him, but the man who actually finished him off was Abdullah, mm. was the brother of Habib and the son of Nusayba Umm Amara. Radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in. So it was actually Abdullah ibn Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu who went forth and who actually uh, uh, killed Musaylama who had dismembered his brother and who claimed that false, uh, that false prophethood. So Nusayba actually saw that happen and she said, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed me to see the enemy of Allah be taken from this earth. And it was the same mindset, subhanAllah. Remember in Uhud, the kuffar shouted out and they said, our, they said a day for a day and the response from the Prophet some of the companions was what? Your dead are in hellfire, our dead are in paradise. Mm. Remember when she said on the day of Uhud that I do not care what happens, yeah, what happens to me happens after to this me. day 
Yeah. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, we're going to be his neighbors, we're going to be his companions in paradise. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her that ability to, to be there on the battle of Yamama. But subhanAllah, and this is why I said this is one of those stories that has a lot of sacrifice. Nusayba lost her arm on that day. Oh. Radiallahu ta'ala anha in that battle. And you know what she said? She said, I did ihtisab. I sought the reward from Allah for one of my two sons and I seek the reward from Allah for one of my two hands. Mm. She continued to fight and she was wounded over 11 times and subhanAllah, miraculously, she did not die. Her granddaughter describes, subhanAllah, looking at Nusayba radiallahu anha, this old woman. Imagine a seven-year-old woman walking through mm. Medina that has witnessed multiple battles that's been wounded over 30 times. And she has fighting alongside the Prophet وسلم, and fighting against this false prophet. This is Nusaybah radiallahu ta'ala anha, Umm Umara. And she goes on and she insists when Selfless. Yarmouk happens, she goes and she fights in the battle of Yarmouk too. With one hand. With one hand where she, she can carry her. She went sword. after? Oh gosh. And she refuses to stay back. I'm going to end with one story, subhanAllah, in this regard. Mm. Miraculously, this woman doesn't die in the battlefield. Wow. She actually dies a very, in, in her old age, a natural death, radiallahu ta'ala anha, and she's buried in al-Baqir, in, in al-Madina. But she lived to the khilaf of Umar al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu, and can you imagine, like, seeing her walking the streets of Medina? <laughs> like, subhanAllah, like, knowing what she's been through and knowing what she's done, this woman has experienced sacrifice in every single observable way, and you see her walking the streets of Medina. I mean, she's a pretty intimidating woman in a, in a sense of heiba, just awe, right? The awe that you would have of Nusayba bint Ka'ab radiallahu ta'ala anha. And it was said when Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to receive gifts from foreign emissaries, he'd send them to Nusayba because he's like, the person that deserves this is Nusayba because of all that she did for Islam. And one time, there was a package of some silk garments that was brought to Umar anhu, and it was considered the most expensive foreign gift that he received. And so people gathered around him, starting to give him suggestions about what he should do with it. And some of the people said, you should give this to your daughter-in-law, the wife of Abdullah ibn Umar, Safiya, the wife of Abdullah ibn Umar. You should give this expensive garment to uh, Abdullah ibn Umar. And Umar ta'ala anhu said, this isn't something I'm going to give to Ibn Umar I'm going to, or to his wife. I'm going to send it to the most entitled person in this ummah. The person who deserves it most from this ummah. And Umar radiallahu anhu is overcome clearly with emotion. And he starts to then narrate, on the day of Uhud, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that I saw myself on the day of Uhud and when I looked right or left, I saw Umm Umara radiallahu ta'ala anha swinging her sword. And Umar radiallahu anhu sent it to her. This is our hero for today and subhanAllah, a woman that is remarkable and in her own right is truly in a league of her own. Umm Umara, Nusayba bint Ka'ab radiallahu ta'ala anha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her. May Allah azza wa be pleased with her family. And just as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to make her and her family his rufaqa, his close ones in Al-Jannah. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala make us from the rufaqa of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and from the rufaqa of Nusayba, Umm Umara, Radiallahu Ta'ala Anha and her family in Al-Firdaus Al-A'la. Allahumma Ameen. InshaAllah Ta'ala, a reminder to you all, name your daughters Nusayba, please. <laughs> we need some Nusaybas in our ummah. We need some Sumayyas and some Nusaybas. So if you have a daughter on the way, let's have some Rumaysa and some Nusaybas and some Sumayyas inshaAllah ta'ala because these women are incredible heroes from our ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them and may Allah azza wa be pleased with all the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Allahumma ameen. InshaAllah ta'ala next week we will continue and we will move on to the Qurra of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the Qur'an reciters from the Ansar, and we'll start with Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu next week. Jazakumullahu khayran, wa sallallahu wa sallam, baraka nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This was a very, this was a very interesting um, 
story, can I say? Um, because it's a different perspective. It's not a Sahaba. It's a Sahabi, can I say that? And she's also fierce in terms of like a warrior. And it's good to see that type of personality and outlook once up like way back when because obviously when you i think personally when i think about back in the days i don't think of women being a warrior right because i assume that they are not allowed but i didn't realize that even if they are not required to they can still because i'm thinking oh you just stay at home um have kids make meals and that is it right um i didn't know this side right of things so the seeing and hearing this is really good it's eye opening it also gives us a different perspective to the life of the prophet because we see the men mostly's perspective but we don't see the women's perspective but slowly you guys have been requesting the women so that's good but not saying that we don't want to hear or watch the men's of course it's it's also nice to hear or learn about the sahaba we've done four or five sahaba now and yeah it's re- it's always really really nice what is it to um listen to their story as well so thank you for this request um if you like this video don't forget to give this video a thumbs up subscribe and we still have a lot more of this request to finish so they will be uploaded either every two to three to four days just because depending on the length of the video so if it's taking a while for me to post just uh click the how do you call it? The bell button so that you will get the notification whenever I do upload. Thank you guys for joining and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.